Here we will look into the motion of a block with a mass m attached to an elastic spring with a spring constant k. Sometimes that constant is also called spring stiffness. We know that when the spring is neither stretched or compressed, the block will experience no force and thus it will be in equilibrium. If for whatever reason, however, it becomes displaced from equilibrium, the spring will exert a restoring force on that block to bring it back to the equilibrium position. We need a coordinate system centered conveniently around the equilibrium position. Let that motion be entirely along the horizontal direction or along x on our diagram. Here and in the following discussion, we'll neglect any dissipative forces such as friction or air resistance. As we will focus on the horizontal motion, we can also safely ignore any forces that act in the vertical direction. In the absence of any motion along that vertical direction, or y on our diagram, the forces acting along that direction must cancel anyway. And now, let's imagine that the block, for whatever reason, has been displaced a distance x from the equilibrium. At this point, any forces that might have been responsible for that displacement cease to act and we let the block experience only an interaction with the spring and nothing else in that horizontal direction, x. We'll draw a vector to indicate the force experienced by the block due to its interaction with the spring, f elastic. That vector will point to the left in this case, and its magnitude will be determined from the Hooke's law. The elastic force of a spring is equal to the spring constant k times the displacement x. Remember here the minus stands for the force being always opposite to the direction of the displacement. Newton's second law then gives us the following. The net force, in this case minus kx, must be equal to ma, where again m here is the mass of the block and the acceleration a is the second derivative of the displacement, or we have m d2x dt squared. By bringing all the terms on the same side, we get the following equation of motion. m d2x dt squared plus kx must be equal to zero. It is a differential equation, and our goal now is to find its solution and how it relates to the physical conditions that we have. Any mathematics reference book on differential equations instructs us that the solution to our equation must be in the form of either cosine or sine function. Let's choose our solution to be in the cosine function form. We write that our displacement function is expected to be of the form a cosine b t plus c where a, b, and c here are some constants that we need to determine. First, we need to find the second derivative of that function so that we can plug it into the equation of motion. The first derivative of the function will be minus b a sine b t plus c, and the second derivative will be minus b squared a cosine b t plus c. Now we need to take the second derivative and the function itself and plug them into our equation in their respective places. So here's what we have. The mass multiplies the following expression minus b squared a cosine of b t plus c and the stiffness or the spring constant k multiplying a cosine b t plus c equal to zero. The coefficient a cancel we can also cancel the cosine function as we are not interested in any specific time instant but require that the relation holds for any and all time instants t. So let's cancel the cosine function. And now we see that the function we chose for the displacement will be a solution to our equation if the following holds true minus m b squared plus k must be equal to zero or that constant b must be equal to square root of the spring constant k over the mass of the block. That coefficient is called angular frequency and it's marked by the Greek letter omega so we usually have omega equal to square root of k over m. Now, the function for the displacement can be written as the coefficient a times cosine of omega t plus that coefficient c. 
Of the remaining two coefficients a and c, neither can be determined without further information about the conditions of the block spring system. We will discuss them in uh, further detail, but first let's write them in the usual symbols used in physics. The coefficient a remains a and is called amplitude and is related to the maximum displacement of that block. The coefficient c is written as phi and is called initial phase angle. Here, the displacement is written in the form that is usually it's typical in physics. The displacement x of t must be equal to a cosine of omega t plus phi. Here's what we have. We have seen the equation of motion and we just determined the function for the displacement that is solution to that equation. It must be equal to a cosine of omega t plus phi. Now let's have a closer look at the coefficient a or the amplitude. As the cosine function is limited, so will be the displacement of that object. The minimum value of the cosine is minus 1, so we see that the displacement x cannot be less than minus a. In other words, the block will never go beyond a distance equal to a on the left side from equilibrium. Similarly, on the other side, the cosine function cannot exceed plus 1, and so the displacement can never be larger than plus a. We see that the displacement will be limited between minus a and plus a. The absolute value of those limits here, a, is called the amplitude of the system. We already saw that the angular frequency omega must be equal to the square root of k over m for the displacement to be, solution, to be the solution of our equation of motion. Being inside the argument of the cosine function, it must have units of radians per second, identical to that of the angular velocity concept. Only here it is called not angular velocity but frequency. After all, it is inside the argument of the cosine function and its value determines how fast that argument will be increasing and therefore the cosine will be changing its value. And so, in this manner, it is directly related to the period and the frequency of oscillations. Remember, the period of oscillation was defined as the time for one oscillation, while the frequency is defined as the number of oscillations per unit time. By virtue of their definition, the period is always equal to 1 over the frequency. So what is the relationship between the angular frequency omega and the period and frequency of oscillations of the block? Let's examine the displacement at two instants that are separated by time interval equal to one period here marked as capital T. By definition, after one period, the block will have completed one cycle and it will be at its original position. Its displacement, therefore, must be the same as before, or x of t plus the period must be equal to x of t. We know the displacement must be equal to a cosine of omega and here for the time we're going to use t plus the period plus phi or we will get a cosine of omega t plus omega times the period plus phi and that must be equal to the displacement at the instant t or x of t which will be a cosine of omega t plus phi so what we have here is that a cosine of omega t plus omega times the period plus phi must always be equal to a cosine of omega t plus phi for any time and not only at some special instances. That of course can be true only if omega t is equal to the period of the cosine function that is 2 pi. Only then we can be sure that both cosines will always have the same value, regardless of the time instant little t. Omega then must be equal to 2 pi over t, and 2 pi f if we use the relationship between the period and the frequency. So now we know the solution to our equation of motion. We also saw that a is the amplitude or the maximum displacement from equilibrium, and that omega must be equal to square root of the spring stiffness over the mass of the block. We also found out that there is a relationship between the angular frequency omega and the period and the frequency of oscillations of the block. 
what remains is to find out what is the meaning of that initial phase angle phi and what is its value. Like the amplitude A, the initial phase angle cannot be determined without knowing the exact specifics of our problem. Its name indicates that we need information about the conditions of the system at some initial time. The easiest way to illustrate what the meaning of phi is, is through an example. Let us say that at time t equals zero, the block is located at location minus a. And let's find the value for phi then. We know the displacement is given by a cosine omega t plus phi. We plug in the conditions that at t equals zero, x must be equal to minus a. So now what we have is minus a is equal to a cosine of omega zero plus phi. We cancel a and we see that cosine of phi must be equal to minus one. Here phi must be equal to pi. In other words, if our block is located at minus a when we started our time, then we must use pi for the value of phi in the function for the displacement. Only then that function will correctly represent the displacement of the block. If on the other hand, however, we started the timer when the block was passing through equilibrium at t equals zero, then we must use a different value of phi in our function for the displacement in order for it to be the correct solution for that particular situation. The function for the displacement now must reflect the fact that at time t equals zero, the block must be located equilibrium or has a displacement equal to zero or zero must be equal to a cosine of omega times zero plus phi and now we see that cosine of phi must be equal to zero. Here however we get two possible values for phi. Both plus pi over two and minus pi over two will give us a correct answer for the value of phi. But having two possible values for phi points to some ambiguity in our settings. Why do we get two possible values? If we look back into the block's motion, we realize then that the block passes equilibrium twice within one cycle. Once on its way to the left and once on its way to the right. So in our example, we actually did not specify which one of the cases happened at time equal t0. So let's say that at time equal t0, the block was actually passing equilibrium on its way to the right. In other words, at t equals 0, its velocity was positive, that is pointing along the positive x direction. Then we can look at the first derivative for the displacement, which is minus omega a sine omega t plus phi, plug t equals 0 and require that its value of minus omega a sine of phi be greater than zero. That of course requires that sine of phi itself be negative and now specify which value for phi we must use for the correct function for the displacement. Phi must be equal to minus pi over two. In many problems we do not know that many specifics about our system and in those cases, we can usually add some convenient conditions, um, usually leading to phi equals zero. We are always allowed to do so, as long as those um, additional and artificial conditions do not contradict in any way any of the existing conditions of our problem.